Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I turn your attention to the announcements. One announcement is that in two weeks we're going to be out at Viking Lake. Come and join us. We will not be having a potluck. You can bring a sack lunch if you wish to eat your lunch out there. Um, feel free to come. You can sit in, in the picnic tables. We'll be underneath the, in the lower shelter. You can also sit, bring a chair if you wish to distance yourself a little bit more. Um, bottled water will also be provided. So pray that it will be a wonderful, wonderful weather out there. Um, also, our session is working on ways to have people connected, and one of the ways that we're looking at and we're, we're encouraging people to respond is pen pals. If you'd like to have a pen pal, um, I know I have some people at my house with, who would like to have a pen pal. They're getting into writing, old school um, learning here, right, is something we all need to know. That's one of the things we worked on during COVID is how to address a letter. Uh, so if you're interested in being a pen pal, let the church know and we'll get you connected with someone else. Are there other announcements this morning? All right, please join me in the call to worship. Come and worship. Be still and aware of God's presence within and around you. Come and worship. Be still and aware of Jesus' presence within and around you. Come and worship. Be still and aware of the Spirit's presence within and around you. Be still and know the presence of the triune God, the Father to whom we come, the Son through whom we come, the Spirit by whom we come. Hear his word. Be still and know that I am God. Please join with me in the opening prayer. O oh God, we gather in your presence to praise your holy name with songs on our lips and love in our hearts. We gather here because we find joy and love, peace and understanding among your people. We seek to serve you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Deliver us from slavery to all sins. Save us from those who would deceive us. Teach us the way that we should go each day. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might have the comfort of your presence within us day and night. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
lots of people are waiting for a superhero to save them. But you know what? We already have one. His name is Jesus Christ, and he came. He saved us all before we know who, who he was. He has done all the work so that we're freed and forgiven. All we've got to do is come and confess honestly to him and accept that forgiveness. Let's pray a prayer of confession together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is nothing good in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared unto men in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his name. Amen. Friends, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. Know that forgiveness, live that forgiveness, offer that forgiveness to the broken world around you. Okay, have you been practicing your wave at home? Everybody wave at everybody. Right? You practice your Miss America wave here. getting it started okay maybe
Okay. We all got to be kids here this morning, right? Have you ever read the story, Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss? Have you ever seen this? Did they make this? Okay, I'm ticking on you two girls. Did they make this into a movie? What? Yes. They made it into a cartoon, didn't they? Okay. Horton is an elephant, okay? And he begins, he has this lazy bird named Maisie, and she sits on her egg in the tree, and it was boring, which sitting on an egg would be boring. Can we agree to that? And she hated it. So she said, I'm going to take a vacation and fly off for a rest if I could find someone to stay on my nest, says Maisie. And that's when Horton walked by. And Maisie said to Horton, well, would you like to sit on my egg while I take a little rest? And Horton said, uh, I don't know about that. And Maisie said, well, I, I won't be gone long. So Horton agreed, and soon he was sitting on the nest while Maisie flew off to Florida for a vacation. Now, in Florida, Maisie had such fun that she decided she'd never return to her nest. Days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, but Horton kept sitting there. Day after day, winter came and icicles hung from Norton's trunk and his feet. But he still remained faithful to his promise to Maisie. I'll stay on this egg and I won't let it freeze, he said with a sneeze. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant is faithful 100%. Now, I don't know if elephants are, hun are faithful 100% of the time, but I know that people aren't 100% of the time, but we know that God is faithful 100% of the time. And we read all through God's word promises that God makes to his people. He promises never to leave us, never to forsake us. He promises to love us. And we know that God is always faithful to his promises. Today, we're going to be reading again in the book of Esther. And Esther and her people, are, the Jews, are going to face a horrible man named Haman who wants to kill all the Jewish people. But God says in the Bible that he loves his people. So we say, is he going to protect them? I say, yes, he will, because he is 100% faithful. You know, next time you're having a hard day, remember that God is 100% faithful to each of us. Let's pray. Dear Father, as you're faithful in keeping your promises to us, may we be faithful in keeping our promises to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I want to share from you from the book of Esther, beginning with the 18th, 19th chapter, excuse me, 19th verse. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions, as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thanatha and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on gallows. All this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamaditha, the Agite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast the pure, that is the lot, in the presence of Haman to select a day and a month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. 
Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the providences of your kingdom whose customs are different from those of all the other people and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamathada, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each providence and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various providences, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's providences with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as a law in every providence and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out and the edict was issued in the city of Susa, citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Have you ever been punished for doing the right thing? You know, a few months back we studied all about Joseph. Remember this guy? Remember a guy? Now, talk about a guy who did the right thing, but he suffered. He, remember this story, right? He, he sold into slavery by his jealous older brothers. He gets purchased by Potiphar, who is the captain of Pharaoh's guard. God's with Joseph. He blesses him so that uh, eventually he gets to be the head of, of Potiphar's household. But noticing the, but here, here comes Mrs. Potiphar, and she notices the well-built and attractive Joseph, and she decides that she wants him, and she relentlessly tries to get him to be intimate with her. And Joseph refuses. He says, how, how could I do this immense evil? How, how could I sin against God? But refusing to take no for an answer, Potiphar's wife kept at Joseph, and one day when no one was in the house with them, Potiphar's wife grabbed Joseph's garment, Joseph ran away so fast that he left his garment in her hand. Angry and feeling rejected, Potiphar's wife lied. She said Joseph tried to attack her. Potiphar had Joseph thrown into prison, and Joseph was innocent. And his immediate reward for, for doing the right thing was going to jail. Joseph did what was right, even though it was not immediately recognized or rewarded. But God was keeping the only record that mattered. Potiphar would never thank Joseph for his faithfulness, but God had his own plans. Joseph said to his brothers later in, in Genesis 50, remember this, he said, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I love the ending to that story. So what about you? Have you, have you ever done the right thing? Yet you run into trouble instead of reaping the rewards. You know, you find out something you could have kept quiet. You, you could have, but yet you spoke up. Wrong was being done, and you, you couldn't stay silent. But in speaking up, you lost a friend, or you lost a job. Why? You did what was right, what was godly. Why didn't, why didn't you get a pat on the back for what you did? And even if people didn't notice you, why didn't God notice? Well, I can tell you with 100% a surety that God did notice and that God does all things in his good time. As we're going to see in today's reading from the book of Esther, God calls us to be faithful, trusting he is working all things for our good and his glory. Now, we start today's drama already in progress. So far, we've got Xerxes, who, have I sold any of you on how great he is? No. Selfish, drunk, and foolish. What a, what a combo. Isn't that what everybody wants to be? He parties, remember, for 180 days. He gets done with that party. He has another party for uh, another seven days. He calls his queen, get, get over here, and she says, not going to do it. 
He says, that's fine, you're out. After losing a battle and time passes, lonely Xerxes, you can, you can just imagine him sitting by a window as, as his tears and, and the raindrops come down, right? And he is pondering what she did to him. And seeing Xerxes in the dumps, his advisors suggest grabbing for Xerxes a bunch of beautiful virgins so he can pick a new queen. And after setting eyes on Queen Beautiful Esther, who we know is secretly a Jew, smitten Xerxes sets the royal crown on Esther's head. And when we cue in today's story, today we get another glimpse of Mordecai, Esther's cousin, and as you may remember, her adoptive father. And sitting at the king's gate, which for them is, is a place of honor, it's the equivalent of our modern law courts. He's sitting at the king's gate. At this point, neither Mordecai or Esther have revealed their true nationality. They can seem much like, uh, to us, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Remember them? They were secret disciples of Jesus. But yet they were used to protect and bury, protect and bury the body of Jesus. Now, like these two men, Mordecai and Esther were hidden in the Persian capital because God had a very, very special work for them to do. Now, we notice once again that Esther is still obedient to Mordecai. That's very stressed. She's the queen, but she's honoring Mordecai by her faithful obedience. Now, while sitting at the king's gate, Mordecai finds out that two of King Xerxes' attendants, angry at some way, are plotting to kill him. We don't know how Mordecai found out this information. I, I don't think it's information that he tracked down. But he hears the information. He passes it on to Esther. And he's, Mordecai is able to use his position for both the good of both the king and the Jews. Now, in Eastern court, palace intrigue was a normal thing. They, okay, they didn't have the secret service, okay? And so there was only a few officers that had access to the king, and they often used their privileges to get bribes from other people who needed the king's help. And, and while Xerxes wasn't worrying about day-to-day -day operations, he, he, wasn't, he was insulated from day-to-day -day problems, okay? He wasn't worried about whether he had enough toilet paper, okay, or how his clothes were going to get cleaned. He wasn't worried about those sort of things. He had, remember, he was, he's the king of the superpower at the time. He was like king of the known world. So he had authority, wealth, and pleasure, but that doesn't mean his, his personal safety is guaranteed. It was still possible for people to plot against the king, and actually 14 years later from this, Xerxes will be assassinated. Now, honestly, I don't know what you're thinking, but to me it's amazing at this point that Mordecai and Esther choose to look out for King Xerxes. It would have been, I would think, Mordecai would have some resentment toward Xerxes. After all, the king had taken his, his beautiful cousin, his adopted daughter, into his harem. Yes, she'd become queen, but she didn't have any say in that. Neither one of them did. It, it's not like Xerxes was a great guy. This is, this is not a Disney movie where, where the prince is just a prince, okay? He's not great, Okay. He's unselfish, he's unrighteous, or he's unselfish, he's selfish, he's unrighteous. I think was Mordecai afraid of what would happen to Esther if there was an assassination attempt or a successful overthrow of the king? We don't know what the, why they did what they did, but we know they saved the king. Now Paul tells us in Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. As we interact with people around us, our, our friends, our coworkers, our family, our neighbors, whoever the Lord brings into our past, we're to work for their good. We're not just to work for the good of those who are kind to us, but for the good of those, good of even those who wound us. As Christians, we have a lot different view of the world. We're to treat our enemies as Christ treated us, offering them the love, the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness we've already received. From Jesus Christ. Now, this is all in God's plan, right? God, in God and his providence, he enabled Mordecai to hear about the plot and notify Queen Esther. Now, you would think at this point what would happen? King Xerxes would be like, oh my gosh, I'm forever indebted to you. I give a great party. Let's have a party for you. How about a, how about a medal? How about an award? Nope, nothing. Warren Wiersbe said, Mordecai received neither recognition nor reward for saving the king's life. But no matter, God saw to it that the facts were permanently recorded and he would make good use of them at the right time. 
Our good works are like seed that are planted by faith and their fruits don't always appear immediately. One of our questions for this week, I hope you've been getting those, is how does it feel to know that you may not reap any benefits of the seed planting until after death? See, God says it's, it's never to be about our glory, but about his. But yet, even when we're focused on God's honor, okay, this next part of the story is a doozy. Okay, so not only does, get this all straight here, not only does Mordecai fail to get rewarded, we are told an Agite is promoted to second in command. Now, we're not talking about an Aggie. Do you know what an Aggie is? Right, some of you know what that is. We're not talking about a Texas A&M graduate here. This is what we're talking about, okay? We're talking about a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. I always have trouble saying that. Amalekites whom Saul failed to kill. And in other words, an Agite is a hated, I mean hated, enemy of God's people. So just to be straight here, Mordecai saves Xerxes' life. He gets no kudos. And one of his people's most hated enemies is put into power. Okay, did you get all that? Now, I'm sure Mordecai must have thought to himself, where was Haman when people were plotting to kill the king? I was the protector, but Haman was promoted. You know, when we've done the right thing and others are rewarded or get opportunities we believe we deserve or we've earned, we've got to turn to God. We've got to say, we're not going to be discouraged. All is going to be made right. God is keeping records. Now, notice that Mordecai's deeds are also recorded in human books as well. We're going to come back to that. God calls us to be faithful, trusting he is working all things for our good and his glory. God's timing is the best. And just remember, this story is nowhere near over. So Xerxes commanded all to honor Haman, but Mordecai refuses to bow to him. And while we're, we're not told what fueled Mordecai's rebellion, we see that Mordecai will not waver. And some of the king's servants notice his nonconformity and want to know his reason. And all they learn is that Mordecai is a Jew, and that has something to do with his refusal to bow. And when Haman find out that Mordecai was disrespecting him, Haman is full of rage. Instead of going to Mordecai, what, what regular people would do, you go to Mordecai, you try to resolve the matter calmly, Haman decides that his honor has been so challenged that not only would he make sure Mordecai was killed, he would get the Jewish people wiped off the planet. Then we say, wow, what a racist. And talk about being full of yourself. The only solution is total genocide of the Jewish people because you've been insulted? What would we say? We'd say overreact much? <laughs> now we shake our heads and we go, Haman is unbelievable. But what do we do when people do not honor us as we feel we need to be honored? Yeah, we don't, we don't kill people who diss us, but, but our anger may burn within us, and we kill them through disrespectful thoughts. We think so highly of ourselves. How dare anyone speak to us that way? But as Christians, we're not to be marching around demanding other people honor us. We're to seek God's honor. How can we minimize our personal desires to be honored and maximize our interest in God's honor? We can ask ourselves, are we more offended when our honor is challenged than when God's honor is? Xerxes made a command that all will, were to honor Haman. In Persia, honor obviously had to be demanded. But if, come on, no, no, can you demand that someone honors you? How many people think that's possible? It's, it's not, is it? It's all about, as Christians, as God's, God's grace changes you and me, then we're going to have the desire to honor God and honor our parents and authorities. 1 Peter 2, 17 says, Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, Mordecai's refusal to honor Haman is going to cause consequences for every Jew in the Persian Empire, and our disobedience affects others. God calls us to be faithful, trusting he is working all things for our good and his glory. Now, we may expect that Haman would be like, okay, I got this plan together, let's get busy and execute it. But he doesn't do that. What he does is he, he chooses for the purr to be cast, okay? So it's like rolling dice to say, okay, let's pick the day and the month for this genocide. Now, what, what Haman doesn't understand is this verse. Proverbs 
16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Now, I think Haman's search for a lucky day shows he's under God's control. It's, it's lucky, all right. It's lucky for the people of God. Because the day, listen to this, the day the pure is cast, the pur is cast, is the day before Passover. Okay, how many of us know we're, we're back to the Ten Commandments movie? Do we, we're always circling back around to this one. Picture it, right? The plagues come. What's the last one? All the firstborn are going to be struck down, right? So they take, you remember that, you know this. They take the lamb, they put it around the door, right? The blood and the, it passes over them and they don't get killed. That's the day when God saves his people. They come out of slavery. Remember the whole Red Sea parts, all of this. Go home and watch the Ten Commandments this afternoon, right? Okay, the Red Sea parts. Now the people could say, is God going to do it again? I think remembering what God has done in the past gives us courage and hope as we face new challenges. Again, we don't hear the name, God's name, in the book of Esther, but we certainly see his fingerprints everywhere. Now, Haman is on fire to get this done, so he runs to Xerxes, introducing a threat. And he does, he does exactly like Satan does, and this is what he does. He mixes fact and falsehood, okay? So, so Haman tells the truth. The truth is that they're an ethnic group who have different laws. That's true. But what's not true is that they don't obey the king's laws. And Haman says, it's not in your best interest, your best interest, to tolerate them. And Xerxes acts like he always does, which is what? <laughs> Poorly, right? I mean, are you impressed with, come on, are you impressed with this guy? Not hardly, okay? He, he listens to, wh whatever advice he gets, he listens to. And basically he just says, okay, I'm abdicating my responsibility. Here's my ring. Do what you want. Make the decrees you want to do. Xerxes, Xerxes doesn't even ask what people are going to be destroyed. Did you notice that part? Now, based on, on what we know of Xerxes, I, I would bet that none of us are shocked that he has little regard for human life. But we know that every person is formed in God's image and has value. Whether abortion, genocide, murder, nowhere in the Bible will you find permission to support disregarding any human life. And as believers, we should be pro-life in every way possible, including in our thoughts and our actions toward all people. How do we treat people? We're different in, in skin color, ethnicity, religion, political party. Especially in today's culture, we're to strive for the work of the good of all people. We've got to examine ourselves for prejudice. We've got to vow to love all people, working for justice for all people. I love this quote, you will never look into the eyes of someone God does not love. Now, having convinced the king, Haman puts his, his evil plan into action. In the name of the king, Haman commands all people in the empire to completely annihilate every Jew, regardless of gender or age. Doesn't that just give you the, it just puts shiveries down your back. Scribes are gathered, and the decree was translated into every language and script of the empire, so everybody understood. No Jews were to be left, and once, once they were annihilated, they were to take all their stuff. With the decree posted, Xerxes settled down. Did this part strike you? Xerxes settled down for a drink with Haman, while the Jews face 11 months of waiting for their annihilation. Now, I can't imagine what the Jews were feeling. How's this going to turn out for us? You know, many of you actually have been in a similar spot. You get a cancer diagnosis. You find out you've lost your job and your health benefits. You've learned of your child's addiction to pain medication. You're facing financial ruin. How's, how's this going to turn out for me? Yeah, we say... Okay, we know how this thing ends, right? We know how Revelation comes out. Yes, we have God's promises, but what about the details of our lives? God calls us to be faithful, trusting he is working all things for our good and his glory. Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the 
olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there is no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. See, even when we don't know what's coming next, we know our God. We recall his faithfulness to his people by reading his word. We can recall his faithfulness to us by remembering all the times he's provided for us in the past. Maybe we can't see God right now. Maybe we can't see God working in our lives. Maybe we feel he's far away. Don't give up. He's right here. Since the Garden of Eden, a decree of death has hung over the world. There's only one solution. God saving us. But you know what? God has chosen to do that at a great cost to himself. The price has been paid in full. We've been saved. And no one can stop God from protecting and preserving his people. Stay tuned. Hang in there. Just when your enemy seems to have the upper hand, place your trust in God and realize that the day set for your destruction may actually be the day of your deliverance. Amen. As we come to a time of joys and concerns, other joys and concerns to be shared this morning, we want to lift up prayers for, the, for Kevin Davidson and family. Um, let's also be praying for um, Marsha Lorette has passed away. Let's, let's keep them in our prayers. Are there others this day? Everybody's quiet. All right, let's go to the Lord and pray together. Holy and gracious God, how could we not give you thanks and praise for all the wonderful, wonderful things that you have done for us? We thank you most especially that you are the God who has unlimited love, mercy, and grace toward us. Lord, we don't have to wait for a Savior, Lord, because you already have saved us. The day of our deliverance has come and is coming and we thank you thank you thank you for that we thank you that you do everything possible to draw us into relationship with you and i pray lord that as this pandemic continues we you would do just that that you would draw people to know you that you would draw people to to place their hope solely in you lord we thank we're thankful for each person who's gathered here this morning who'd be with us in person who's with us online we pray your blessings would be upon them this day. We thank you for this church and for its ministry and mission. We lift up to you those that we're partners with, and we think of Travelers Oasis and Kukusui Schools, for Ice Servants, for Christ Covered, for the Pregnancy Center, for Joel and Krista McCutcheon, for Kati, for Sophie. Put your, protect all these groups. Help them to have the resources they need as they minister in your name. Lord, we're thankful for our church members in, in nursing homes and assisted living. We think of Marilyn and Shirley, for Odette and Bud, Merlin and Velma and Pat, for our many other friends that are not only here in Red Oak, but across, across this, this nation, Lord, and we pray your blessing to them as well. Lord, we know also that there are many who are in need of your tender, loving care this day, and we, we lift up to you those that were affected by this huge storm that happened in Iowa. Lord, so many were already struggling because of COVID and to have their crops ruined, their homes ruined. Lord, I pray that, that help would rise up for, for our friends in Iowa and that, that um, they would see your, your care and your providence for them. Lord, we know that there are many who are suffering this day from COVID, and we ask that you put your healing touch upon them, and we boldly ask that you would take away this virus. Help us to slow the spread. Help us, um, especially as, as children are ready to go back to school. We pray for the teachers, the administrators, the staff. We pray for wisdom and good, good guidance. We, we thank you for those who are so ready and willing to educate our children. We, we thank you for that, and we, we just pray we can get back into a rhythm this fall. Lord, we know there are many others who are in need of your tender, loving care, those with recent cancer diagnosis. We lift up to you um, prayers for Kevin Davidson and family. We think of um, the Marsha Lorette family and ask your blessing and your peace to be with them as they grieve the loss of Marsha. 
Lord, we know that there are many, many others this day who, who maybe are struggling in silence with grief. Um, we lift up to you, Monica and her family and the loss of her brother. We ask that you give them comfort and peace as well. Lord, you know what each of us need this day, and we know that you are ready, willing, and able to provide that for us. Thank you for that. Thank you for the blessing of us gathering together today in your name and for the power that comes when we pray together. And we lift up all these prayers in your precious name, you, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, how appropriate it is that we can bring our offerings to God after we have been fed richly by his word. I want to encourage you and thank everyone at home who is very generously giving to our church during this time. I thank you for all those who have given, and I just remind people that you can put your offering in the white boxes here. And also feel free to send a check as you're able to our church address, 511 East School Ball. Let's take a moment and give God thanks for these gifts. God, thank you. Thank you for slowing us down enough that we can give you thanks and praise for all the things that you have blessed us with. We thank you most especially for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We also thank you that you invite us into your mission and ministry. Lord, open our eyes as needs come to us as a church, as individuals, that we might do what we can to meet those needs. Help us to have the care, love, and compassion you have for all people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, let's stand and sing together the, lo the love of God.
and now receive God's blessing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.